My first job as a software engineer in Canada paid me $3,000 per month after taxes, while I was paying $2,700 to rent a place to live within an hour commute time to the office. I thought, okay, it's just the start of my career, it will become better pretty quick. Three years later, I have a six-figure salary. Welcome back to another series on the hands-on of Software Academy channel. Now today, I'll be taking you all the way to Canada. As you know, here in this initiative, I teach you skills. I give you pointers to how productive and how profitable you can be with technology, science and technology, especially in line with computer science. Now, if you gather all these skills, you will discover that one of the major focal points of interest is how much you can make as a software engineer. Today, we'll be reviewing a video by a random person from Canada who migrated in Canada and wants to share with us some of the costs of living as a software engineer in Canada. As a software engineer in Canada paid me $3,000 per month after taxes, while I was paying $2,700 to rent a place to live within an hour commute time to the... That's just a difference of 300 Canadian dollars. Now, obviously this guy is within um, the Northern American sphere. That's where he is working as an engineer, as a software engineer. The office. I thought, okay, it's just the start of my career. It will become better pretty quick. Three years later, I have a six-figure salary, but it all goes to taxes, rent, and food. Taxes, rent, and food. Now, these are expenses that are uh, that cannot be ignored, and for the fact that it cannot be ignored shows that you know um, whatever you're earning or you bring to the table after removing your expenses you know is your profit you know and sometimes there is a very thin line in between these expenses and what you can save in the bank as your own profit take home profit in this video, I will summarize what I've discovered about salaries in Canada while working for three different companies. Like I said, uh, this guy is in Canada and is a typical example of what you can expect if you decide to go to uh, places like this. Companies, as well as the cost of life with detailed monthly expenses and also my thoughts on the balance between those two things. First, salaries. In Canada, junior software engineers with zero to three years of experience earn from 45 to 60k. Intermediate engineers with one to eight years from 60 to 120k. Years from 90 to 150k. Now let's take a look at this um, screen analysis. Is uh, depicting junior engineer from zero to three years within the range of 45 to 60,000 Canadian dollars and the intermediate one to eight years as between 60 to 120 Canadian dollars. Then the senior engineer three years plus from 90 to 150,000 Canadian dollars. I think, well, to me, I feel this is a lot, but the issue with most of these countries is the expenses, you know, you talk of the tax system, the house rent, you know, these are the play two major uh, variables that take the chunk of the earnings of people, you know, so it's more like saying the rich getting richer, the poor getting poorer. But if those two uh, is controlled or minimized, especially the rent, if at all you don't have um, control over the tax system, if the rent can be handled where probably perhaps you buy a house, then 
I think that might make a little bit of sense. I didn't synchronize the number of years because there is a wide range of how fast people progress in their careers and which company they work for. In my understanding, the chances that I will be able to earn meaningfully more than a median salary, which is 110k for a software engineer in Vancouver, are not very high. I keep getting invitations to apply to senior roles that require many years of experience and pay just a bit over 100k. I have friends who are working as senior devs, have 10 years of experience and okay. earn from 100 to 150. 150 sounds like almost an absolute maximum that I can dream of in Canada five years from now. Junior entry-level engineers get paid 200k. After three or four years, software engineers are doing 300k or so. By senior, they're doing about 400k. With the sign-on bonus, it was like a 600k income. Some of you might say, 150? What are you even talking about? It's huge money. Well, wait for the part about the cost of life and my conclusion in the end. The root cause of such a salary cap is so-called wage suppression. Canada brings an excessive number of overqualified immigrants so that the companies do not really need to raise salaries. They always can... Now, let's take a pause at that. Uh, he's trying to say that Canada brings in uh, a kind of great amount or, you know, excessive overqualified. I mean, if you're going to define this, this should be people who are skilled and with, not just skilled, but with, uh, perhaps uh, qualifications, paper qualifications, a degree, a postgraduate, you know, and so on and so forth. So if they have them in excess, that would mean that uh, the price will fall because if the supply is high, what that invariably means is that the price will fall since there's excessive supply. So somebody somewhere is profiting from this immigration process to Canada. Hiring new, well-qualified immigrants instead who are ready to be paid less because they just arrived, they don't understand the true cost of life in Canada yet, they have no choice, they think it's temporary, they think they will earn more in the future, that in reality it never comes. Isn't it funny? When I was looking for a way to get into a developed country, I thought that Canadian immigration program makes so much more sense than in the US because it favors education and experience, while the US one is more random. But now I think that the one in the US favors more the US citizens in general, while a Canadian one favors property and business owners. But now when we have the earnings, let's look at what this money can buy. I will be calculating the expenses for someone like me, a family of two adults, two kids, and a dog in Vancouver, but I will... A family of two adults, two kids, and a dog. Also touch the debate about how the cost of life varies for different seats. Now well, that's interesting. Yes. Let's consider a 100k salary. That's 8,300 per month. 2,500 goes to Texas. The biggest expense is housing. In 2023, I would budget about $3,000 per month for a family for housing in Vancouver greater area. There is a shortage of rental properties here. If there is a good apartment for rent with a realistic price, there will be a competition among 5 or even 10 people easily to get that apartment. Next expense is utilities. Roughly $100 for heating, $100 for home internet, $150 for two mobile phones, $50 for electricity, and maybe $100 more for subscriptions like Amazon Prime, iCloud, Netflix, 500 for everything in this category. We spend about 350 per week on food, mostly in Costco, that's 1,400 per month. Just the usual basket of vegetables, chicken, eggs, milk, bread, nothing extraordinary. For a five-year-old financed car, a monthly payment can be 330, insurance 150. One full tank of gas costs about $100. We also need to service a car twice a year and buy tires maybe once in three years. So now, let me just quickly look at these figures. Let's take at these figures. He's talking about um, 8,300 uh, Canadian dollars in a month, and then you have um, 2,100 for taxes, 3,000 dollars for rent, uh, 500 for utilities, 1,400 for food, 330. Uh, that's two, five, um, then. Um, Five, 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 six, five, well, that's uh, seven. I mean, that money is almost gone. Let's budget 400 monthly for gas and service. 
And now the main expense that does not allow Canadians to purchase a home of their dream. Let's cut that Disney Plus subscription. We haven't yet calculated any purchases like clothes, furniture, electronics, books, eating out, gifts, travel, wow, 400 left for just half savings. Entertainment, saving, investing. We cannot afford any of that on a six-figure salary in Vancouver. A very tight budget for basically paying the bills. If there are two working adults in the family, maybe there is a chance to afford some of those things. But then potential daycare or after school or, God forbid, a second car will eat a good chunk of that second salary. Now, a lot of people told me in the comments to my previous videos that Vancouver is not Canada. My only problem is that I am in the wrong city and it is very different in other parts of the country. And one of the most popular comments was a suggestion for me to move to Calgary. So I've done some research, even talked to a real estate agent and a mortgage broker from Calgary. And what I've discovered is that, yes, sure, housing is cheaper in Calgary, but it's not cheaper to the point of being affordable. You still need to pay around $2,000 to rent an apartment and about $2,500 to rent a house. So maybe you can save up to 10 k per year on rent in Calgary but salaries in Calgary are not higher. Levels FYI shows 80k as a median salary for software engineers in Calgary and 110k for... Now, this is the analysis for um, yet another location in Canada. I think the first one reflected uh, Vancouver. Alright, so you can see that there is really not much of a difference. Vancouver? Recruiters from Calgary reached out to me several times and they were proposing roughly a 20k pay cut to what I currently have. So those numbers sound about right to me. I can save 10k on rent but lose 10 to 20k in salary. What about owning a house? In Vancouver greater area owning anything is completely out of question. There is no option to move further to the suburbs and get cheaper housing as it's a relatively small piece of land bordered by the ocean, the mountains, the US border and farmlands. Wherever you go here, housing is still impossibly expensive. In Calgary, though, a house may cost roughly from 450 to 600,000, which means that with a 5% down payment, the monthly mortgage payment will be more than $3,000 or at least 50% of what's left from a six-figure salary after taxes. Okay, but we can buy a townhouse in Calgary or Edmonton. It would cost around 380k, 2,300 per month mortgage, and also 400 strata fee. 2,000 property tax per year and again not less than 50% of a six-figure salary. So, a software engineer working remotely for a shiny Vancouver-based tech company has to pay 50% of the income for a modest townhouse in affordable Calgary. However you turn it, if you make it right, all income would go to taxes, housing and food at best. It's not that Vancouver is unaffordable and Calgary is affordable, it's that Vancouver is just impossible and the rest of Canada is highly unaffordable and overpriced if compared to income. So the only option to make the ends meet is probably to work remotely for a tech company from a large expensive city while living in a really small, least developed, almost a village. Now, here's the way out. Working remotely, yes, it's becoming uh, very, very trending. Because if you work remotely, a lot of costs are actually cut down. Uh, namely transportation and uh, you know transportation is one huge chunk for anybody that is of a working age you know, we need to budget for that and if you take that out and you work remotely and you live in a cheaper location in uh, you know wherever you are in the world then there is a chance of you of you succeeding and at this point I started thinking of a Canadian immigration program as a government-run scam that aims at... <laughs> the guy is now, you know, he's trying to um, refer to um, Canadian immigration as a scam. Let's hear what he has to say. Party educated people from all over the world lose their life savings and the most productive years of their lives, making them work on low-paying jobs in order to support the housing prices and quality of life the previous now, here's the thing this guy is trying to say. He's trying to say that the Canadian immigration program is a sort of scam. In quotes, you know, in a, it is describing it as um, they are trying to bring in people from various parts of the world who will use their life savings. I mean, like here in Nigeria, 
Canada seems to be a thing that uh, everybody seems to be talking about. But very few people know about these facts or these underlying um, issues that is in this country. You know, everybody just wants to flow into it, you know, and all that. It's okay to seek for greener pastures, but I, there's also something that you should bear in mind that the grass is greener on, on the side that you water it. If you water yourself well in any uh, location you are on earth, I, I believe you're going to make it. All right, so it doesn't have to, you don't really have to burn out your pores or go to a long distance just to achieve something. I mean, for instance, look at remote work. If you work remotely now, a lot of people are making millions of dollars from remote work. Once you can deliver on your work, you deliver, you'll be having more clients and uh, you eventually make it without even being employed, you know, or being, uh, you know, uh, trapped down in a specific office or a routine. Generations of Canadians because there is nothing else in Canadian economy that can do that. And after these immigrants cannot be squeezed anymore, they are just being thrown away and substituted with new ones. And the cycle repeats. Why are you such a strong word and call it a scam? Well, because potential immigrants are being shown the dream of a prosperous country that best of the best can join, work hard and build their Canadian dream. In the year 2023, it is light years away from reality. And I recently realized that when I was taking a decision to move to Canada, I was getting information almost only from those who had a business incentive for new immigrants to move, like real estate agents and immigration advisors, mostly on YouTube and the like. Their information is too skewed to the positive side, and they are very far from being realistic and honest. They came here 15 years ago, built some kind of a small business, bought a couple of properties before the prices skyrocketed. They are very unlikely to work as employees of whatever sort. And they are promoting Canada to regular folks like it is an attractive country to immigrate now. If they were to say the truth, it would be something like, oh, we bought this nice house 10 years ago, it costs three times more now while the salaries remain the same, so all the recent immigrants are completely screwed. We've managed to buy a second investment property and that's how we've already retired. Oh, by the way, there is a family of doctors living in our basement very nice, hard-working family, it's totally fine, they like the basement, it's a nice one, it even has windows, they pay us just a half, just a half, not even more of their income. Uh, basement, a doctor living in the basement, wow, that's, that's appalling. To rent the basement, but these doctors temporarily working at Tim Hortons will be fine, you should come to Canada too, it's a land of opportunity, look at us, we've made it, so you will make it too. Look, I have nothing against the financial success of these people. If they have it, it's well deserved. I'm just against promoting Canada like nothing has happened in the recent years, and it is the same as it was 10 years ago. And I'm not trash in Canada, by the way. It is still an interesting country. It has its advantages that I described in one of my previous videos. I am personally much better off here now than in so many worse places in the world, and I still would move to Canada, at least for the passport, knowing what I know now. And there are still chances that I will end up moving to a city like Calgary, but having a more realistic information would have helped me to build a much better strategy from day one, and that is what this video is about. The realistic picture is that 99% of new immigrants are working just to afford paying taxes, rent and food, no matter where they live and, and where they work. There is almost no perspective to own anything or get ahead in a meaningful way. The opportunities that existed here 20 and even 10 years ago do not exist now. They don't exist even for doctors and engineers. I honestly don't understand how the hell do people survive here while having a 50k job, which is an average salary in the country, by the way. Standards of life for new immigrants in Canada are falling off a cliff. There is no housing, no health care for new immigrants, even though we are paying taxes in full. Extreme wait time for any however simple service. Salaries are low, cost of life is high. Wow. And, these were and these are two opposite ends. If the salary is low and the cost of living is high, oh, they, that's a huge gap. It's a huge gap. We should start any discussion about immigration to Canada and then repeat it again and again. And when this is crystal clear, we can move on to talking about the advantages. This video is also maybe about demystifying my own myth about Canada. 
It is just a country among the others with a brutal competition between humans for a very limited number of places under the sun. It's not that Canadians are first world people with houses, healthcare and democratic government day and night thinking about how to improve everyone's lives. It just happened to be a country with no war on its territory, a country with clean air and water, nice people, safe roads and beautiful urban areas, which is already a lot by the standards of today's crazy world. It's just that opportunities are not currently here. I hope that information helps someone. If so, please consider giving this video a like and subscribing to the channel. It would help me a lot. Thank you. You know what? I don't discourage you or anybody from migrating. Migration has always been part of the human race or the human uh, you know, life on Earth. Okay? But the most important thing that I want to bring to us here is that some of these countries that we are in pursuit of might not even be the greener parts or might not have the best of the greenest parts that we are seeking, the greener pastures that we are looking for. You know, the grass always seems greener on the other side until you get there. So wherever you are, you can be what you want to be without anybody or any bars holding you back. I want to put across to you uh, the story, a brief story of FaceTag. FaceTag was started by two young graduates in Lagos, Nigeria. And like a little idea, it grew. And no long afterwards, these guys got funding what millions of Naira. Not just millions of Naira, millions of dollars. You know, and it all started right here. So wherever you are, all you need to do is put yourself together, have your goals in place, and don't be distracted. Don't be discouraged by, you know, a lot of limitations around. A lot of us, the, a lot of people have been through um, things, but they made it through. The same story goes with Flutter Wave. So please enable to subscribe to this channel. Like, comment, share. Until next time, this is me signing out for now. Cheers and all the best.